Let's see, what's my hand? Four on one. Okay. Lola. So you got a hundred. Yeah. You did. That should make you feel good. Got to use yours as a key. <laughs> no, you did fine. Most of you have done fine. The mistakes that have been made have been relatively small or <clears throat> not organize or not organizing your and the rest of the reason you make the mistakes is you're not organizing your work to show up correctly. And so therefore you set yourself up for error. Well, the one question that I had in the word all evening was uh, what you managed to do and there was like one one match could have been uh, um, planned, organized, uh, recruiting the five yeah, it depends on which way you're. That was fine. When you didn't find all, I was only looking for a total of five. So you had plenty. I was worried about that one, but I wasn't sure. You're fine. I said, I that I've graded six so far. So I'm pretty pleased with the results. And we'll go over the test on Friday, and I'll give it back for those who want to. Um, but your grades will start appearing, well, they'll all appear together. So they should appear on Wednesday. Depends on when I get the last one graded. I said, I've only done six so far, so i got a ways to go. There are also lots of different ways you can solve the problem. And so I literally have to follow your logic through the problem. And so that's why showing the work is so important. So, you know, if you miss, if you mess up one step and you lose two points, if you show your work correctly, out of a 30 point problem, that's really not a problem for you. So there are lots of opportunities to get lots of points on that test. And that should put everything in the system for midterm. Pretty close. We may get the project coming up. So. Okay, we got 12 participants online. Okay. It's 21. We're still missing seven. Or eight.
I haven't looked at those at all. We'll go over that tomorrow. In class. There are. There are like like most of the things we'll attack. There are probably, and particularly when you're dealing with Excel, there are probably four or five different ways of doing the, the same thing in Excel. And so I provided some doing it one way and some doing it another, but the same result. Okay. Some of them had the parentheses, some of them had the and sign, the forward instruction. Right. So using the ampersand would have been the easiest. It's a shortcut. Mm -hmm. we'll, get, we'll go through it in class. We'll actually do it on Wednesday. I'll, I'll make sure we do. So, and then we will. We're going to jump off of Excel for a little while, and we're going to go to project management. I'll introduce that next week. And that will be on that for several weeks. And then we'll come back to Excel. Again. Okay. So I'm showing participants 15 online right now. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and here twenty-five. So we're only missing about three. Uh, okay. So let's talk about uh, the next big section in the book, which is measuring productivity, and that immediately goes into product life cycle, which immediately goes into new product development. So for the next series of lectures, we're going to be um, focused on those topics. And we're going to go through them pretty quickly. So productivity is actually pretty simple. Pretty simple. We've already introduced the equation. Uh, productivity. Actually, I'm just going to go P. P, productivity P is equal to the total output or output, doesn't have to be total, output divided by the input. Oftentimes this is expressed as a unitless value, such as a percentage for 34% efficient efficiency is what we're talking about. But it's rarely the actual, it's rarely the correct way to use it. The correct way is whatever these units are is the, what you're, you're measuring. So you could be measuring value of output versus the do, say dollar on the output and dollars on the input, and that would be a unitless number, and that way you could get that. Um, but it might also be something as simple as total units outputted versus number of labor hours inputted or dollars input. Very simple. But let's think about what productivity is first. What is productivity? Right. When somebody says they're productive, what does it mean? Get a lot done. To get a lot done as it relates to uh, can be or or what's important. Right. Um, you can spend a lot of time doing things that aren't important to what you need to get done. So I mean, how many of you sat down with your homework before and go? Man, I got through that really quickly. That was very efficient use of my time. Kind of like that. Just, I'm really glad I got through it that quick, really quickly. I was able to stay focused. You're being highly productive. So, 
Oh, let's see. How many classes do most of you attend on, like on Mondays? Three. You're doing four classes, three, three classes. So let's talk about three classes. And then how many hours of homework are you doing? Theoretically, it ought to be, you're doing three classes, that ought to be nine a day. Nine between, I'm sorry, nine between classes. So, um, means we may need to increase our homework. Um, not telling you that. Um, but, <laughs> so let's talk about how much time you spend actually putting into going to class. So let's kind of walk through this. So we're going to talk about how much time you put in to get in. Let's let's round this up to three hours of class, right? Actually, it's more than that. Yeah, per day. Three hours on a Monday, right? How many hours of effort do you put in to do that? Well, you got three hours in class, right? What else time you got? You got tra uh, travel, right? You got to travel to class. It doesn't matter if you're on, if you're driving a Honda or you're doing Shoe Leather Express, right? You're going to be going to class. It takes a certain amount of time. So I'm assuming it takes anywhere from um, 30 minutes, 10 to 30 minutes to get in for most of the class. All right, what do you else do you have to do to get ready to come to class? Preparation. Okay. Um, uh, collection of materials. Some materials. What in your book? What else? Let's give that 10 minutes. Yeah, you get up, you get dressed. In some of you, this may take longer than others. Um, when my daughters were teenagers, it would take them two hours to get dressed to go to school uh, or longer. Okay, so you're prepping, you're getting up, you're getting dressed, showering, brushing your teeth, doing all the prep work you need to be engaged, right? What else are you doing? And let's say that takes an hour. That's 60 minutes. You got to eat. Not only that, you're doing that three times a day. And let's say that ends up being 60 minutes for the day. What else are you doing to prep for class? Reading, studying. So you're actually doing your assignments. And say, let's say you're doing three classes and so you're doing, let's say three hours. So that's 180 minutes. Uh, so, or one, two, three, five hours. And let's say five and a half hours. Is that right? Yeah, five and a half hours plus class time. So it's actually eight and a half hours. You spent eight and a half hours to do three classes. How productive are you? 
You do the math. Which is something less than, well, that's about 30, a little more than 30%, right? 35%. And this is unitless because it's hours versus hours. That makes sense. And anybody else, have you thought about how much time you spend getting ready to go to school every day? You go to class every day? Now you can convert this other ways. You can convert this to dollars, how much you're paying for the class. And so, I don't remember, I think it was a calculation. You're spending, for three classes, you'd be spending, I think, about $150, I think. Might be higher than that, a little bit higher than that, per day. Three classes. So you're spending eight and a half hours in order to get $210 of value. That's the number. So if you're taking four classes, your numbers will go up differently according to along those lines. Obviously, you do it by credit hours. You could do it by, there are lots of different ways to measure. But there are efficiencies. Now, we did this on a specific day, so you can measure the specific uh, productivity on a given day. You could do an average, because if you're going to classes mostly on Monday, Wednesday, Fridays, your Tuesday, Thursdays are lighter than your Monday, Wednesday, Fridays. Or if it's the opposite, your um, Tuesday, Thursdays are really heavy and your Monday, Wednesday, Fridays are light. And so you can average the numbers out. In, in operations, why do you think we want to measure this? You, you do. You want to focus on if we could cut this by one hour of time that you're having to invest and get the same outcome, how many would feel good about that? You gain an extra hour in your day to use how you want to use it. We all would like to have that extra hour. There are two concepts that I want to introduce here. When you, when you want to make improvements in things, you have to measure them. The things you measure, you will get better at. It's one reason you're given grades in class. If I'm measuring you, then um, you know that you have to, you can, you can adjust your amount of time that you're putting into the course so that you maintain your grades. So if I've got somebody who's spending 30 hours a week studying for this class and they're getting an A, getting 100, they could actually adjust that a little bit and say, okay, I can study less. My grade will drop off to say a 92. I'm okay with that. You, you make strategic trade-offs in the process. By measuring it, you can do that. So that initial measurement is called benchmarking. You set up a measurement and you say, ah, this is wh where we are. And it's like having a GPS. The GPS tells you where you are. 
It may help you find where you're going, but it knows where you are. That's what it measures. You may put in a destination where you want to go, and because of obstacles, you may not be able to get there in a time that you like, but it knows where you are. Um, so you, you're benchmarking it. When my son graduated from West Point, I gave him a graduation gift, which was a risk GPS, military grade. And um, second lieutenants in the Army have this long tradition of always being lost. And so uh, he said it was great. He would hang it on the outside of his uh, armored vehicle and uh, so that because he couldn't get signal inside the armored vehicle, but he could get it on the outside and he was the commander of the vehicle. So he could look up there and his GPS was um, five times, oh, well, 10 times more efficient than the military system was. And so he could get grid coordinates within um, 10 centimeters. Uh, and so it was great. He goes, I was never lost as a lieutenant. May not have been where I was supposed to be, but I was never lost because I always knew where I was. Okay. And that's what we're talking about here. Knowing where you are. If you know where you are, then you can adjust and go to where you need to be. Um, benchmarking. Once you know where you are, you have a starting point. And you can say, okay, now you can start doing the strategic planning portion of this and decide where you're going to invest your money, well, your resources, not just your money. Uh, because this might also involve time planning, engineering time, computer systems, might involve a lot of resources that you might want to invest in by saying, okay, we can make this better. We can make it more efficient. Hmm. Um, so this is basically your starting point. And yet over time, you'll adjust your benchmark because you want to be able to say, okay, we've come so far and so the new benchmark is here. Maybe you may make that measurement quarterly, maybe you make that measurement uh, annually. I've been in companies where we adjusted this every year and then how much progress we made on the benchmarks was dictated our bonus bonuses that we got because these directly tied to productivity or, or to profitability. Productivity equals profitability. That's another thing. More effective you are, the more profitable your company is going to be, the more profitable your operations are going to be. We're going to do a lot of problems related to this over time. I put some videos uh, in the module this week related to this. I encourage you to go and watch those videos. So now I want to talk about product life cycle. This is an important, very important strategic concept, product life, the uh, product life cycle. This has to do generally with the number of units you're selling. Could be also profitability. Profitability is not a bad way to measure. And this is time.
there are four phases to product life cycle. Let's get back to my notes here. Dr. Bailey? Yes. What's to the left of the thing? Units of profitability. All right. Okay, so there are four phases. The introduction phase. Characteristics of the uh, of this phase is that generally you have no competitors. The profitability is extremely low. You're not selling enough product to break even generally. Um, your processes internally are not efficient. Your supply channels, your quantities are too small to get the discounts that you need to lower the cost. Costs are high, profitability is low, competition is darn near zero. The next phase is the growth phase. In the growth phase, your, your product design has stabilized. You, you know, you're, you're out in production here, trying to get everything working right, and um, there are bugs in the system, you're working those out. By the time you get to here, all those things are resolved. Your product is very stable. You're now getting enough customers that you can do effective forecasting. So the number of customers, number of units you're selling is going up. This is also an expansion phase. You may have to add more lines, more production locations, more, more distribution points. And this is where you start making money. Profitability is achieved usually. Now you're into a maturing market. Maturing market. The mature market, your competitors are well established. You're probably going to have somewhere in the neighborhood of, of two to seven, generally for every product that's out there. Your volumes are going high. You've built the capacity out. Your um, your supply chains are well established. You're getting the uh, discounts that you need. So you're lowering your internal cost for every unit you're producing. You have established good quality control systems at this point, good cost controls at this point. And then there's the declining phase. Declining phase, productivity, uh, you have all the advantages, productivity and supply, but customer demand is dropping off. There are lots of substitute products in the market. And that's driving down your profitability. Does that make sense? You're going to have to be able to discuss all of these points on a test coming up uh, in detail, apply to a specific product line. So profitability, we're going to say profitability is, I'm going to see if get a different color here. Profitability is low here. Well, that's not working. Let's see if this one works. 
Yeah, profitability is low. It starts to go up. It starts shooting up like this. It tends to flatten out during the maturing phase. Actually, maybe even a little bit of a decline. And then it starts to drop off, but never goes below where we were. See, there is a, actually, this should be above the line here. Yeah. Crosses over. There we go. Losing money, losing money to here, making money, making money, making money. And this is true with every single product in the market. But there's a trick. You can reset this model. This is a time frame. And it's, the time frame is different for every product. I used to be in the computer business. And this time frame was three years. Product in, product beginning, the product in was three years. That number has now been extended in the computer industry out to five years. Quality of the products have gone up uh, and costs have come down dramatically. So this is pretty simple, but you can reset this chart by product modifications or the introduction of a new product. Okay, just because you, you can actually extend the life of a product out here, oftentimes if you introduce a new product that gives the customer the additional features they want, there'll be a certain number of people who will still want this. And a perfect example of this is Apple. Apple sells their iPhone and Let's see, the two, the 7S was introduced um, five years ago. And in cell phone business, this life cycle is probably three years in general, maybe a little bit, even a little bit less. Um, so when they introduce it, demand, demand goes really through the roof and they're asking a lot of money for their products. Apple is very proud of their products. Okay, what's a 7S go for now? I mean, they'll give it to you if you go into the phone store to do that. Matter of fact, they'll give you an 11 usually right now if you go in to change your plan. Uh, but you can get one uh, if you buy it straight up for about $150. But they were asking $1,000 for it before, okay? And they probably out here probably had $300 in cost, but they were able to squeeze the cost out over here. And so they can still make money at where they're selling it right now. They may not be making a lot of money. They might be making, you know, I'm thinking probably $50 a phone. But if you're selling a million of them, that's a lot of money. And they're not only selling them in the US. See, they'll take their older technologies that have already been paid for and they'll sell them into third world markets where they don't have to invest in developing new, um, new products for them. Uh, they'll go into Africa, and I've done this, uh, in Southeast, South Asia, and they'll sell products in those markets and so you go, well, how are they making money? They're making it on volume, but they're also getting it through other things, um, through the store. You know, they're making, you buy the apps that they'll have set up out there that they have some control over. They'll make additional money that way. Additional revenue streams. Um, they don't have, they can introduce new products into that market, which means demand would be high they actually introduce a new market here in the US where they've already paid for all the infrastructure and they just keep making the same product. You've expanded the market so they can extend that life a little bit more. But when you introduce the new product, Apple does this pretty well, they will come out almost immediately and drop the price of the old products 
across the board, usually about a hundred bucks a piece all the way down the line. So they'll have five generations of iPhones sitting out there and they'll drop one off usually now. Uh, and so they'll shut down one line that they're no longer making. They're saying, okay, we're not gonna make this one anymore. Or we'll, we'll revise the one that we've got out there and we'll give it just a little bit bigger screen and we'll call it, you know, the 7S uh, or the 7X, what do they call that, X? Oh, I can't remember, I used to know all these, but it doesn't matter. Um, they'll go through various versions of it to make people want their product. So Apple just had an introductory uh, meeting this last month. They introduced new software for all their iPhones um, before they told all the vendors, which is bad business. And then they, um, they introduced the new iWatch and they lowered the cost, the prices on the old iWatches same time pretty much kept the watches about the same price just lowered the older generation as you're coming into it now and i think that was the i watch six that they introduced i remember correctly so and it's going in the direction that i've been seeing a lot of these the watch will become the phone one day you'll have a an interface that you carry with you a brick that won't be your phone. It'll just be an interface to your watch, which will be your phone. And so um, as the electronics get smaller and smaller and smaller, what you really only have a need for is a bigger screen and or a way to be able to type on it. All the hardware can be in your watch, which over the next 10 years, you'll start to see this. Plus, there's a huge industry out there for medical applications related to the watch. And uh, if you go and look at the patents that are being filed, if you look at the literature that's coming out in the medical industry, they're all about these new devices that people can incorporate into their lives so they monitor health issues. And if you think that's a small market, you're wrong. And it, um, up until the introduction of the iWatch, most of the iPhone market was initially people under 30, and then the people under 40, and then the people under 50. The iWatch changed that dramatically, and now the iWatch is actually becoming a medical device, which people now want to have the iPhone in order to go with the iWatch, so it all integrates. So they changed up, but the people now over 40, are the ones who have most of the medical conditions in this country. And, you know, there are, there's things from everything from wearing a contact lens that can measure your um, blood sugar or, and or your blood pressure through your, a contact lens. Um, you can have drug dispensing devices implanted under the skin. And once it picks up whatever signals are being sent back, it can dispense the drugs that are in the implanted device. Um, Apple's tapping into that. I think all the uh, major players in that market will be moving hard and fast towards that market because not only do you get individuals paying for the devices, you also get the insurance companies start paying for the devices. Um, there are devices that you can swallow and will replace um, tracking uh, uh, certain procedures that will need to be done. Um, there are uh, additional uh, devices that can be used to just plant, implant it under the skin to measure everything from heart rate to blood pressure to um, body temperature. Um, I think you'll see it in athletics even more than it is now. Athletes working out oftentimes want to know how efficient they are at measuring the CO, you know, how efficient they're using CO2 in your body, oxygen in your system. What type of core temperatures are you hitting? 
all those become an issue that you can measure very readily. And I think for high performance athletes, this is coming very, very quickly. The new technology will apply to those, and these are all new products that are being introduced. And so if you were a maker of, or an engineer, or a uh, product specialist on the team for Apple, who are trying to decide what product features are gonna go into the next generation of iWatch, you need to be looking at all of those different things. You need to be looking at the literature. You need to be talking to medical professionals. You need to be talking to um, the staff or professional athletes. What is it that they need? What is it that they want? And that's the very first stage of product development. Wasn't that slick how I went to that? So <laughs> um, you, you, you're you having that conversation. I wasn't completely random. Um, you're having that conversation with potential customers about what they would want or like to have in the product. Doesn't mean you can give it to them, but you wanna know what they want. You wanna know who are the leaders in the field and what are they seeing coming. And you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure this out. You can go on and you can read articles on uh, Google Scholar about these developments. Um, you can read marketing reports related to it. You can actually go out and interview your own customers and hold focus groups and, and just work through each of these. You can talk to uh, people over 50 in various groups and say, okay, what would make it easy for you to switch to something like this? A device this large isn't going to continue to work very long. I mean, this, is, this looks like a sport watch. Um, And that's for a certain group of us, that's great. That's what we want. But they're gonna to need to get smaller. They're going to get need to get to looking better. Apple's trying to do that, but they're still fairly large. And uh, as we move forward, that's gonna work eventually. New product development. So we talked about this in general related to the iWatch, potentials for it. If I'm not Apple, why would I care? If I'm not Apple, why would I care about all these developments? You could be in the competition. What if you're not in the competition? <clears throat> you could be an investor. Could be an investor. Good point. What else? You could be developing ancillary products that would be supported by this new technology coming out. So you have another way to make money. You're not making money off the iWatch, but you're making money because of the iWatch. That makes sense? And you can't introduce your product until that product or one that's a competitor can now uh, monitor that. So for instance, I can do an EKG on my watch. And so can, you can do it also on the iWatch now. Um, mine also measures O2 content. Don't know how accurate it is, but it's, I, I just haven't read a study on the accuracy of it. And so that's good to know. Good to know. If you're working out, you, knowing the O2 count is a big deal. If you are uh, an older person in an EKG, you got a heart issues, EKG is something you might want to run periodically. Establish a baseline. New product potential means that you could be selling ancillary products that no one else has thought of that could be supported by it. Apple was the first to go away from the standard headphone connector. 
because they're trying to seal up the devices. And in order to build in the, a waterproof nature to all the phones. And that's what's going to happen. They're going to eliminate all the ports on your phones over the next three years. Not just Apple, but Samsung will do it too, and probably Google. And so there are two reasons that you have ports, usually only two reasons, there's actually three. Three reasons why you would have to use a port on your phone. What are those? Charging, that's a big one. Speakers, headphones, I'm not wearing mine, mine are downstairs right now. Um, what else? Yeah, well, you got to be able to change out the cards, but a lot of those cards are built in, made unique for the, the customer. So you can make, even make that where it doesn't have to be. Or you can make it so the back is removed with a gasket and can be sealed up again. Transfer of data, audio, and power. So we've solved the audio issue. You don't have to plug into your phone in order to listen to the audio. And it's become, uh, wireless headphones were really expensive for a long time. Now you go on Amazon and you get some that, um, I listen to them for audio books. I buy them for 19 bucks all day long. In fact, I literally bought four of them last week because my wife uses some, and so I always keep a couple in, in spare, and I keep one plugged in all the time in the office, so that if I'm listening to one and it dies, and I'm not there, or I got one at home, so I have one always plugged in at home, one plugged in here at the office all the time, and I usually have one on. Um, I'm sure you've seen me come to class with it from time to time, and I forget to remove it. So that issue's been solved. So the power issue is what? Still a big deal. So how are they trying to solve it? Wireless charging, non-contact charging, which is still not very efficient. It, it uses more electricity to do that because it's an induction method of drawing power out. What else? What other problems are there with it? Takes longer to do. Takes much longer to charge your phone. Uh, I'll plug my Samsung Note in, and for every minute that I have it plugged in, I get 1% generally. In the lower ranges, it's almost two, but generally it averages out to be about 1% per minute, which is great. I'm here, sitting in a room, and I plug it in, and I say, okay, I got 20 minutes. I can get a 20% 20 charge on my phone, and... I feel good about that because 20% can more than last me a day. And I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, but I do the wireless charging and depend on what charger I'm using, it can take anywhere from three to five times longer to charge. It does degrade the battery. We're gonna need a new battery technology with that. So that's a different problem. Um, I'm wondering, is there not going in the direction that's like, what's the value of it as opposed to, like, say, Facebook on the charger and then. It does today. So now they're engineering to reduce that time. You want to go more down the road and not work because there's going to be a payoff. But then, do you worry about where your phone is wet? I mean, to a degree that you need to change all the time. I've had lots of phones get wet over the years. I, well, I've had one personally, but with five family members, it was more common than you think. My wife came in one time and pulled off a, a sweatshirt she was wearing when she was working out, and she threw it into the washer and washed it, and the phone came out with it in the dryer. Not a good situation. Um, my daughters were the worst, though. And they they would go through a, at least a phone a year getting it wet. The speakers would quit working, you know, things like that. And, or the microphone would quit working because they've gotten it wet drying their hair or 
whatever it is they were doing in the bathroom. It just made a mess. And I was constantly replacing those. Um, yeah. yeah, it's been nice since I've grown up and now they're responsible for their own phones. So, uh, um, yeah, no, it, it's pretty common. I mean, you've had a phone where they've gotten it wet and it quit working. There you go. Yeah, it's pretty common. Um, it's not a fun experience either, because you may or may not recover everything that's on it. Um, if it's still working and it's only the microphone or the speaker that's gone out, you definitely can get it all back. But if it's just dead, it might be a bigger problem. Um, so that presents some opportunities for companies who want to make chargers. That presents opportunities you want to, for companies that want to introduce new batteries into that industry. And uh, some of the new technology that's coming from Tesla right now on batteries look to be the most promising because they're going to go with a completely new type of battery, salt-based battery, and um, it holds a lot more energy per unit area in the battery in gram size. And if you can do that, then you are um, changing that industry because everybody wants a battery that lasts longer or is cheaper. Just depends upon what you're looking for. Any questions? Product life cycle, we will continue on on Friday. On Wednesday, we will um, start into the process on product development. I will be in here on Wednesday teaching the class. Uh, you are not required to come to class, but if some of you want to, you're welcome to. Okay. All right. Any questions? Bye, guys.